Good afternoon and welcome to Spot 2020. My name is Jim Longley. My friend and partner in everything harmonica, Kelly Cunningham, and I are going to present Tuning Up Your Tin Sandwich this afternoon. We're going to go through a series of steps. Uh, usually we divide it up into four steps. Each step builds off the previous step. And we are going to teach you how to take your out-of-the-box harmonica that sounds airy and not tuned very well and make it sound a lot better. Let's get started. Our first step is to address one of the biggest performance problems many out-of-the-box harmonicas have, air leaks. Making sure your reed plates are flat and providing a proper seal can increase the responsiveness and efficiency of your brand new harp. We're going to start off with some of the tools you might need for working on your harps. Screwdrivers, sandpaper, typically wet or dry sandpaper, something to mount the sandpaper on, a flat surface like granite or glass or even machined steel, and a straight edge to evaluate the shape of the reed plates. After you have disassembled your harp, you need to clean the metal parts. You can use an ultrasonic cleaner with clear water and a few drops of white vinegar or hydrogen peroxide, or you can use hot water with some mild dish detergent and a soft bristle brush to accomplish the cleaning. Now it's time to check the flatness of your freshly cleaned plates. We're going to check the flatness of both the draw and blow plates. You're going to check the flatness of the plate by taking a known straight edge, a machinist scale or any other machined thin straight edge across the width and length of the plate. Hold it up to a light source and look for light leaking past the plate against the straight edge. This will tell you where you need to bend the plate. Usually the length of the plate, you can bend the plate with your thumbs and fingers. The width of the plate may require a tool. Now I'd like to turn the presentation over to Kelly Cunningham, who's going to demonstrate flat sanding the draw plate for you. So what we like to do is flat sand the draw plate. And before we um, start, we like to draw marks, little marks a lot, between each one of the slots so that we know we're getting good coverage on our sanding as we proceed through. Uh, we use 400 uh, wet or dry sandpaper for the first pass and 800 wet or dry sandpaper for the second pass. And um, that just gives us a nice flat plate, very smooth, uh, pretty airtight. We use double-sided tape and it's fairly cheap to hold the uh, sandpaper onto the flat surface. So in this case, we're using a piece of marble. Uh, it's just a sample from like a hardware store. Uh, a lot of times you can ask them for, un for samples that they don't um, uh, use any longer. You could use uh, glass, you could use machine metal. It just needs to be flat and hard. Put a piece of tape at either end. I don't like taping the middle where, where the uh, plate's actually going to be sanded. I don't want any ridges. I want to have as much flatness as possible. So I, I actually tape to the ends and then stretch the paper onto that tape. You can see I leave, leave little tabs so that I can easily tear the tape off when I'm done. So we're going to start with 400. And I'll adhere it on one end, stretch it, and adhere it on the other. And it's nice and flat. And as I start sanding, I just want even pressure on the plate. I can use uh, my fingers from both hands. You can see I'm doing either a figure eight or a circular motion. I can also just use Fingers in one hand, it just needs to be evenly distributed. Okay. 
you can see we're starting to make progress. You can also use the meaty part of your palm. And that's probably one of the best um, ways to get consistent pressure on the whole plate. So pretty close. And I go until I barely see any or don't see any marks a lot left. I barely see it. That's pretty good. All right, second pass. Take off the 400. Put on the 800. You can see I've used this paper before. That's perfectly fine. It holds up to a lot of different uh, flat sandings. So this time on the 800, I'm actually going to go front and back and side to side. The reason I'm doing this is because it creates a bit of a different reflection pattern on the plate. And you can see more clearly where the sanding is taking effect. You should be able to see that difference. And I try to get it to where it's all even. So that's perfect right through here. You can see a little bit of a little bit of a uh, area here that we need to get better, but we're excellent through here. Okay, at this point we want to wet the plate, clean off of the dust, and then we're going to come back, leave the plate wet, and put it back on the sandpaper. You can see that I left the plate wet after washing it. I was able to wash out some of the sand dust. Then I'm going to put it down wet and this is going to give it a bit of a polish. I'm going to be a little lighter on it. I'm not going to try to dig in as much and the circular motion is fine. This is just kind of buffing out and I'm, I'm just barely putting any pressure on it. Just kind of buffing out the deeper portions or buffing out the edges of uh, the sand scratches, if you will. And you don't need to go too far. You're not trying to take away a lot of material. You're just trying to smooth it out. And that'll be about it. So time to wash it again. So here's our finished plate. I've just dried it off. And you have a real nice, shiny, even reflective surface, which is what you want. And it's nice and smooth. Now that we have our reed plates flat, it's time to start working on the reeds. We're going to check their shape their gapping, and their alignment. Some of the tools that we use for reed work include shims to support the reeds while we're working on them, a burnishing tool to allow us to reshape the reeds, a combination reed wrench and plinking tool, and a light source to allow us to isolate the individual reed and view it better. Our objective in reshaping the reed is to get the reed to fill the slot from the rivet end to the free end at its most closed position. When you're reshaping the reed, you support the free end of the reed while pressing the rivet end of the reed into the slot to make it fit better. We're using a tool to support the free end of the reed, and in this case, a flat burnishing tool to press the rivet end of the reed into the slot. So once you have the rivet end of your reed into the slot where you want it, you may find that you have too much of a gap at the free end of the reed. Now you're going to need to reshape that, and the next couple of slides will cover that. To correct the problem in the previous slide, 
You can bend the reed into the slot by using either a thumbnail or a reed tool. Plinking. What is plinking? Plinking is just using a little tool to raise the reed and let it snap back into the slot. Boing! It allows you to listen for any debris that might be trapped in the slot or between the slot and the reed. And most of all, it relaxes the metal that you've just reshaped back toward the shape that it's going to reside in naturally. Plinking is a good idea to do after every adjustment. Plinking is the way that allows you to check to see that you have adjusted far enough. You may need to go back and adjust again after you've plinked. You do it every time. Here's the corrected read with a gap equal to or less than one reed thickness between the bottom of the reed and the top of the reed plate. To sum up, this is what we're working toward. The reed flush to the reed plate near the base, near the rivet end of the reed, curving up to a gap at the free end of the reed that is approximately equal to the thickness of the reed or less. Sometimes it's necessary to align the reed in the slot for best performance. Aligning the reed is just lining the reed up so that there's an equal gap between each side of the reed and each side of the slot. The easiest way to align the reed is to have a backlight. It's also kind of necessary to have that backlight isolated to one reed slot. This is an example of a light box patterned after one made by Richard Slay. It's kind of an elaborate light box. It does isolate one slot for you. We can also show you a method to isolate one slot without having to go to all that time and expense. Hey, this is Kelly again. I've got an idea for you for a quick and easy light box for checking reeds and working on your harmonicas. Most of us have smartphones or some sort of tablet device. If you open up the Notes app in your tablet device, it gives you a nice even white light uh, that can be used to see through the reeds or through the slots of the reeds on your harmonica. To cut that off, you could use construction paper. I like to use a thin mouse pad and I cut a slit in it. So I, I bought this mouse pad fairly cheap and cut a slit into the mouse pad. The nice thing also about the mouse pad is the, the soft surface holds the harmonica a lot better when you're working on it. The slit in the mouse pad blocks off all but one reed. Makes it easy for you to adjust to where it's right in front of your eye. And you've got a real good image of the gap between the slot and the reed itself. This is great for uh, checking alignment of your reeds, for embossing, for any of the reed work that you need to do uh, and, and evaluate how your reed performs. This is a good example of a properly isolated backlight. Now you'll be able to see what you're doing while you're working on your reed. The Silverwing 3 Spaces Lightsaber is an innovative and inexpensive tool for being able to backlight your reed plates without removing them from the comb. This is an example of using the Silverwing Lightsaber on a reed plate that's still mounted on the comb. This is kind of an extreme example of a misaligned reed. Playing this harmonica would result in a buzz as that reed slammed against the side of the slot. A little bit of wrench work and a good backlight and you can see that we have gotten this reed aligned in the slot properly. Increasing responsiveness. Responsiveness is basically the ability of the harp to respond to your playing. Here are some of the tools that we use to help us increase the responsiveness of our harps. 
The first technique we use for increasing responsiveness is called embossing. Basically, embossing is burnishing the edges of the reed slot down into the slot so that they get closer to the reed itself. This is a end view of a reed residing in a reed slot, just giving you an example of having pushed the metal over a little bit into the slot. The area that we emboss is typically about 80% of the reed slot. This is the most active portion of the reed and includes the end of the slot. In this slide, we are using the ball end of a tuning fork to emboss the slot. The ball end of the tuning fork gives you the advantage of giving you even pressure on each side of the slot, but has the disadvantage of not reaching the corners of the slot. Similar to the previous slide, a socket out of a socket set can give you the even pressure that you desire on each side of the slot, and because of its square profile, it can reach farther into the ends of the slot. A technique that we picked up from Richard Slay involves using a leather burnishing tool with a fairly sharp point on it to burnish the sides of the slot. It requires a little bit better dexterity because you're going to shape the sides of the slot separately. The big advantage is that sharp point allows you to work all the way to the end of the slot, into the corners, and the end of the slot itself. Waxing. We apply wax to the rivet end of the reed for a small portion of the reed in order to minimize the amount of air leaking past between the reed and the slot in that portion of the reed which is the least active. We like to use the plinking end of a Richard Slay tool because it is just about the right size for our purpose. We use beeswax because it combines the right amount of stickiness and flexibility to accomplish what we need to accomplish. All you need is a very small amount, about the size of a head of a pin. This slide gives you a sense of scale as to just exactly how much wax you need to accomplish what we're doing. This slide shows how the wax has been pressed into the slot at the side of the reed. And we use the rest of the wax on the other side of the reed at the rivet end. Once the wax is applied, we use the chisel end of the tool to remove excess wax at the rivet end of the reed. And this is what it should look like when you're finished. With a proper backlight, we can see where the wax has remained after we've scraped off the excess. This is wax that's been pressed down into the slot between the slot and the reed. A new technique was recently shown by Brendan Power. Brendan wanted to find a way to tighten the gap of the rivet end of the reed without using wax in the gap and reshaping the reed down into the slot of the reed plate. His concept was to build up the surface of the reed plate around that end to tighten up the gap. He found that nail polish pens provided the material he needed. At this point, Kelly Cunningham is going to take over and give you a demonstration of how to apply the nail polish technique. wanted to show you how we uh, do this process. So I'm using a, um, a nail polish pen. And they're a little hard to get started. Uh, they come with a little piece of um, piano wire that can actually make sure that you get uh, them unclogged um, after use. But you, you uh, support the reed at the base and then use the reed itself as a fence to guide the pen. And you just squeeze out as you go down the length, just like that. Um, I'll do all the reeds, let them dry for an hour or so, and then I'll come back and I'll use my smallest uh, shim uh, in my feeler gauge set 
to actually slice a lot, uh, slice an opening between the reed and the uh, polish. So keeping keeping the shim closest to the reed rather, and, and retaining most of the polish. And that gives me a really good seal on that rivet end of the reed. Okay, so my work has cured. Now usually I'll do all the reeds, not just one, but this is just a demo. So I'm going to take out uh, my shim and I'm going to use my thinnest feeler on my feeler gauge. And I'm going to go in between the reed itself, keeping the shim close to the reed and slicing an opening between the reed and the polish. I'm going to do this on both sides. Just like that. Now my reed is free. And <clears throat> the gap that usually exists and lets a lot of air pass is pretty well sealed up. So that reed should perform fairly well. Step four, tuning. We put this step last because it's a good idea to wait a minimum of 48 hours after you've done any of the previous steps to let the metal rest. To tune a reed, you're going to remove material from one end or the other of the reed. In order to raise the pitch, you're going to support the free end of the reed and remove material. To reduce the pitch of a reed, the first technique that we'll show you is to file the edges of the rivet end of the reed. The second technique for lowering the pitch of a reed is to use a scraper to scrape away material. In this example, we're using Andrew Zajac's five cent tuning tool. Now my partner Kelly Cunningham is gonna take over the presentation and demonstrate the tuning process. I'm going to show you how I tune a harmonica. I wanted to take you through the tools first uh, that I'm going to be using. I have a straight screwdriver, a Phillips screwdriver. These are for taking apart the harp, of course. A plinking tool. This is Richard Slay's uh, plinking tool and reed wrench. And then this is what, uh, this is from Andrew Zajac. This is a five cent tuning tool and plinker and reed support. I really like this. This is my favorite thing to tune with. And it's a ceramic file. Uh, jewelers use these and I find it gives a real fine um, surface to what I'm, what I'm sanding off on, on the brass reeds that is. Um, it gives me a lot, a lot of control. Uh, for bigger uh, swings of tuning, I use uh, a mini grinder. This is similar to the one that's sold uh, by Seidel. Um, I found this online fairly inexpensively. And what I like about it is it, it has low enough torque that I can actually put my finger on it and slow down the spin a little bit. So it gives me a little more control over how much I'm, I'm actually grinding off of the reed. And this is another tool by Andrew Zajac. It's what's called a French tuner. And it allows you on the blow plate to tune it fairly easily, uh, giving you a part of a comb to tune the harmonica by without having to reassemble your harp uh, to get a tone out of it. Um, it's, it's machine made. Uh, out of a phenolic, it looks like, uh, but it also lets you lets you tune the octaves. And he's got an instruction sheet that comes with it as well. That's pretty nice. Um, and then lastly, uh, I I like folded over post-it notes as my read support. Um, I've got I usually have one for the blow and one for the uh, draw plate. Um, as you can see, they're numbered. Um, one's numbered backwards from the other. So today I'm going to be tuning a, uh, an E-flat harp that I've got. 
Um, I'll go ahead and, and play a couple notes on it so that you can, you can hear what it sounds like before tuning. It's, this is the blow. And here's the draw. And you can obviously hear some discordant notes. I'm going to go ahead and take this one apart. Uh, this one has slotted screws in it. All right, cover plates are off. We're into the business end of the harmonica. And let's get the reed plates off from the cone. Okay, we're inside. Um, before I tune, I like to clean the harmonica. Um, I don't want any uh, spit residue or anything like that um, affecting the way the tuning sounds. So I'm gonna go clean and we'll be right back. So I've got my replates and my comb uh, cleaned. I cleaned the reed plates in the sonic cleaner and then I cleaned the comb by brushing it, making sure all the stuff was off of it. And I will be using the French tuner on the blow plate uh, to help me with my tuning. I mentioned Andrew Zajac's tuning method, uh, which is actually on his website. We will provide a link to that uh, at the end of the presentation. Um, but I've got Pretty much a menu to go by that lets me know what my tuning references would be and my scent deviations off of the actual note and that's what helps me get through a tuning. The tuner we like to use to tune our harmonicas is an app for iOS and Android either phone or tablet called iStrobosoft by Peterson. We like stroboscopic tuners for their accuracy and uh, for their visual cueing as to the trend of the note. You see four bars that seem to be rotating. The bar on the furthest left going to the bar on the furthest right goes from least sensitive to most sensitive. So the idea being that you're going to stop all those bars. They don't look like they're rotating up or down whenever you are on the note. You'll also be able to see the scent deviations from the note uh, right below the note. Um, and in this case, it's showing you not just the scent deviations, but the tenth of a scent, which is probably more accurate than you need to be, but it's kind of nice to have that kind of accuracy. And then down in the lower right-hand corner, you see the reference frequency. In this case, concert A440. Most bands and instruments tune themselves to 440 as a reference. The harmonica being a free read instrument tends to flatten as you put more uh, air through it. So as you're playing on stage or playing in, with a band, you're, you're putting out some more volume and your harmonica is going to tend to flatten, uh, start to go flat. So tuning it up to a different reference frequency, such as 442 instead of 440, actually is, uh, and is something that you want to do for the harp. But right now we're at 440. I'm going to play a note, and I'm going to try to take my embouchure out of it as much as possible. Just uh, light, even air is what I want to tune with. I don't want to tune with, I don't want to blow hard. I want light, even air. And let's see, see how close we are. So we're pretty close to the actual note. You saw it swing from, let's say, negative one to just above, uh, just above zero. And, but the, the bars from left to right uh, got very close to stopping. That note, if we were tuning to four, four, zero, was pretty much on the money. That's pretty close. Um, however, if, if uh, we want to tune a harmonica, we want to use 442 as our reference. 
and that's for the tonic of, of the harmonica, usually on blow four. And to change that is pretty easy on this program. You actually swipe to the left and it opens up a menu. Click on tuner settings and you'll see concert A. You'll see the reference frequency for con concert, a, concert A. And um, we can click on the, the, uh, the Hertz value. So you'll see that I've changed the Hertz value to 442 as my reference. And then I'll go back to the main screen of the tuner. And you'll see the concert A reference fundamental is 442. Now this is where I'm going to start my tuning um, for uh, blow four as with 442 as my reference. And it doesn't matter what key harmonica that you have, 442 is a reference point. Uh, the, the tuning chart that we use isn't tuned to the key harmonica, it's tuned to the deviation away from the note. So it will work on any key of harmonica. To calibrate this device or this app, again, go back to where the screen was that had tuner settings and you'll see advanced settings and under advanced settings, you'll see calibrate tuner. And uh, you can set the input frequency. We would set it to 440 because that's the most common calibration that you're gonna find on the web. Go out to the web, go to Google or a search engine and look for concert A 440 reference frequency. And you will find videos uh, readily available that you can load up and play and they'll play that reference frequency. As long as the speakers are halfway decent on your computer or laptop, you'll hit calibrate now as it's playing. It will pick that up through the microphone of the device and calibrate it within uh, a few seconds. And once you've got it calibrated, you're ready to get ready to go. We're going to start by tuning the blow plate. The blow plate is the one, of course, that has the reeds on the inside. Uh, facing the comb. Um, on this crossover, you can see this ridge here, that, which indicates the front outside of uh, the reed plate. So this is actually your blow plate, reeds on the inside. And we're going to start with that, simply because the tuning guide uh, starts that way. And it makes sense, and it's in the flow that I'm used to. I'm going to be using the French tuner to put up against the blow plate so that I can um, isolate the hole that I want to tune. It also has an octave split so that I can tune the octaves on that plate. It's an ingenious thing made by Mr. Andrew Zajac and available, I think, from his website and uh, Ron Hobby's uh, Rock and Ron's Harmonica's website. So let's get started. Blow plate. On my guide, I'm gonna start with read four, which is, of course, our tonic note for this uh, harmonica, it's an E flat. And I'm going to place French tuner to where I've got access to that read, and then I'll play it, and we'll see how it stacks up as far as the scent de deviations. So on this first step, I'm tuning to whole four, to, I'm tuning whole four, to a reference of 442, which I've got set on my tuner. And I want to have it uh, at zero deviations, zero cent deviations. We're gonna get it close. It's, it's hard to keep it completely <laughs> at zero. It's gonna float above and, and below a little bit, even when we get it tuned. And that's really our breath and our embouchure. So you try to give a nice, even, uh, soft breath to it to get that to get that reference tuning. And you can see we're about five cents under um, on that tuning, so it needs to come up just a little bit. This is where I'm gonna use my post-it note shim. I like to slide them under the reeds. I don't have to slide them under all of them, but they, it usually does pretty, pretty easily. And that gives me a good base for uh, working the reed and tuning it. 
And, and also, I love to reference mine because I get mixed up so easily. Um, but I know where four is. It is marked. So I need to raise that pitch on, on four. So to raise the pitch, we're going to take a little bit of matter off the end of the reed, the free end of the reed. And I'm going to do that with my ceramic file. We've only got about five cents that we have to um, alter. So I'm going to give it just a little bit of a, a sand. And I'm going to stop there. I, I don't want to go too much farther. Um, I want to get a feel for how much uh, change is happening for each step. I'm going to use my plinking tool. This is a Richard Slay plinking tool, and it's got a little chiseled end, and it makes it easy for me to go underneath the reed, lift it, and plink it a couple times. That helps the metal relax, also gets rid of any of that um, dust um, remaining on the reed. Okay, we're going to check our tone again. See, we came up about two or three cents, so we'll make some more adjustments. Taking a little bit more off the end of the reed. Another thing I like about the ceramic um, sander, in, instead of, uh, I guess, a more abrasive uh, sander, is it it's very smooth. It doesn't rough up the edges. And uh, so you can you can get a little bit broader um, broader sanding on the end of that reed. Uh, if you're using something like this, uh, a rotary um, um, sander or or uh, file, you kind of want to make a cup in in the end of the reed. You don't want it to get it, getting over to the edge of the reed because you might take off a little bit too much material. Plink again. Let's check our read. And close. One thing I would like to um, stress, if you do any work on your read, such as shaping or gapping, um, to where you're you're putting stress on that metal. Um, you want to do that uh, a couple days before you start to even attempt to tune. Um, you, you won't be able to tune your harmonica successfully if that metal hasn't had a chance to rest. I'm gonna call that very close. So now we're ready to go on to the next read. So the reason I like this method <clears throat> is it starts with the tonic note, and then you're actually tuning the octaves to that tonic note. Now you can get them close with the tuner, but what you wanna be able to do is play both of those reads at the same time across both holes, and you want them to sound in unison. Um, if, if they're slightly off, you'll get what's called beating and it's an audible beating where the, uh, the wavelengths are dissimilar enough that they emphasize, um, in one area and de-emphasize in the other. And that's what makes that beating sound. So I'll see if I can demonstrate that for you right now. That's actually not too bad, so let's play seven by itself and see where it's at on the tuner. It's real close. So let's raise it just a little bit. You're not gonna hear a lot of beating, or it's gonna be very hard to hear, especially uh, over um, the microphone that I've got on this device. I'm going to raise it a little bit, get it close to read four. Smaller read, smaller need to take off 
or brass. Okay, playing seven again. Light breath, we're real close. You can see when you blow it a little harder that the note is going to pitch down. That's one of the reasons we tune to 442 instead of 440, which is kind of the standard for uh, bands and, and orchestras, I believe. Um, 442, when you play a harmonica, it actually tends to flatten the notes a little bit as you play with, with more volume, more air. So we tune up just a little bit so that it's more in tune when you're playing with the band. So again, we're gonna take a little off seven. We're real close, I'm not gonna take much off, about that much. Okay, let's hear it. I would say we're dead on. So I'm gonna play the split the four and seven split. That's pretty close. So now we can go on to the next one. So we've got four in tune, we've got seven in tune. Now we're gonna go to the fourth read below four, which is, is the number one read. So four, three, two, one. And one is, again, it's an octave of four. It's the lower octave. So we're gonna blow those in unison just to hear how it sounds. Now that one you should have heard beating. It's whoa, 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 whoa. It doesn't sound very in unison. There's a fine tuning part of tuning it this way that you'll, that you'll see on the chart that uh, Mr. Zajac put together that helps you really refine uh, octaves uh, in, in your tuning process. And that's what gives you that clean, uh, very full chordal sound when you play the harmonica. So let's see what's going on with read one. You see how low that is? It's around minus 22 cents. So we, we need to bring that up quite a bit. To do that, I'm gonna go ahead and use the uh, powered rotary file. And that's on read room number one. Got a nice thick pad on there to give it enough weight to bring it low. And again, I like, I like the speed and the power of this. It's, it doesn't have high torque. It allows me to use my finger to control the speed onto the reed. And I'm, I'm just making a little cup in there. Okay, that's all I wanna do for the moment. I wanna check and see how far that took it. So clink and test. quite a bit. One thing I wanted to show you, if you don't have a French tuner um, or another device that allows you to blow just that one reed uh, with a plate off, you can sandwich the comb and the draw plate together with it. Get it squared up and test the note that way. It works as well, it's just a little more inconvenient. So we're gonna raise this uh, one again. Try to get it closer to our zero reference, A442. I am 
real close. Should be real close. I'm gonna play it in the octave with with the um, the four blow. I'm actually really happy with that. It's got a nice solid sound when I play the octaves. Well, we're gonna be doing the other uh, blow reads. I don't wanna to have to take you through all of this. You saw pretty much the process there. I'm uh, working my way uh, through the blow plate still. I wanted to uh, come to blow five for you because we are gonna change our tuning reference and I wanted you to see that. So now you see that our uh, reference point has changed to 439 instead of 442. So we're gonna tune blow five to 439. Okay, good. It's a little sharp, which lets me show you how we're going to tune um, the reed down. So there's five. There's a couple of different ways to do it. Um, this tool is real handy. It's actually a scraper. So to lower the pitch on a reed, we want to take a little metal off of um, the end just in front of the uh, in front of the rivet. Uh, the scraper tool is a great way to do this. I haven't had a reed fail on me or break uh, using the scraper tool, not so far, in uh, several years. So I'm going to simply draw a couple straight scrapes in towards the rivet on the end of that reed. I'm not, I'm not taking any metal off the edge or sides of the reed, just some scrapes right there in the middle. And let's see what see if that lowered it any for us. Link it again. This is read one, two, three, four, five. Okay, let's play it. I'd call that real close. Okay, so I have worked up and down uh, the harmonica and the octaves to get them as close as I can um, using the strobe tuner and using my ears for the octave splits uh, to try to get the notes as matched as possible. They should sound like one note whenever the octaves are played. So at this point, the blow plate is done. Again, I would like to stress that Two days from now, I'd like to go back and just do a uh, cleanup on the tuning uh, because things may have, probably will have changed a little bit. And so I can get uh, the tuning uh, locked in much more consistently on that second pass. But the first pass is definitely going to get the, the, bigger, uh, the bigger job done. So now it's time to rebuild the sandwich of the two plates and the comb. So I'm going to put those back together. Now that it's back together, we can start tuning the draw plate. The reeds are accessible, uh, so we don't have to use the French tuner. We've already got the comb so that we can uh, play the notes uh, once, once they're, uh, every time we make an adjustment. So we'll get started on that. All right, so we're gonna start tuning the draw plate and we're gonna start with draw read number two. Draw read number two is actually the same note as blow three. So draw two and blow three should be the same note. Let's listen. So I'm going to do draw two, blow three. I can definitely hear a difference there. Um, draw two sounds lower than blow three. We're, we're tuning draw two to reference four, four, three. So I'm going to change my reference on my tuner. Now we're ready to tune two. So I'm going to get a tone on two. And it's significantly flat, as you can see, about 16 cents. So I'll go ahead and tune draw two, and I'll be back.
Okay, so I've tuned draw two by taking uh, some metal off the end of it. Um, I used a rotary file on this one since it's a larger reed. So it uh, now is, is registering well on my, on my uh, stroboscope at 443. It's pretty close to zero, but more importantly, it matches blow three. I'm gonna do draw two, blow three, and they should be the same note. Hear how similar they sound. And that's the object of this first step on the draw plate. Now it's time to tune draw four. So that's. And we want draw four referenced at four, four, three plus one to two sets. So we're a little sharp, so I'm going to take a little metal off towards the rivet end of draw four to lower the pitch. So I've tuned draw four. Uh, to be close, it's about one to two cents over uh, zero reference. And that's at four, four, three. So now I need to do draw eight to match draw four. Draw eight's gonna be right here. And as you can tell, it's um, rather sharp. So I'm going to tune it and get it to where it's going to match um, draw four. As I'm tuning draw eight and lowering the pitch, I'm using my file just on the edges. It's taking a little bit off the edges. Now that's, that's a fairly small read, so it shouldn't take much to change the pitch. That's just about perfect. So draw four, draw eight, very close in character. Draw one needs to match draw four, they're the octave. Draw one, I didn't have to tune. Uh, it was pretty much, at least by our, my stroboscope reference, pretty much dead on. So I'm going to try to draw the octave for you by sealing off these two holes and uh, passing air, uh, drawing air through one and four. It's pretty close. Um, it's a little tough to do because your lips want to ratch, wrap down and actually hit these reeds. So you really have to tilt the harmonica up in your mouth and just let your lips um, touch the edge of the harmonica so that you're not stopping the reeds while you're blocking the other two with your tongue. It can be done, and uh, we've got a real similar characteristic between both, both um, uh, tones. Still working my way through tuning the draw plate. I'm now at the flat sevenths, so I'm going to tune draw five. I can tune it to marine band tuning uh, at reference A440, or in this case, I prefer just intonation. I'm gonna to tune it to a reference of A443 plus one to two cents. Um, so each one of these sections in the, in the draw, it's very much like the blow plate. I'm tuning the tonic, tuning the fifths, the thirds, the flat seventh on the draw plate, and then the ninths on the dry, draw plate. So he's got it separated out, which makes a lot of sense and uh, gives you specific references for each one of those. My last tuning step was tuning holes six and 10. Uh, they reference to 444. And um, I'm also checking the uh, octave split between them. So the draw plate is now done, both blow plate and draw plate and I'm gonna put the harmonica back together and we'll see how it sounds. Okay, we finished tuning and our harmonica is back together. So it's now uh, playable. Uh, again, this is the first pass. I recommend doing a second pass um, and then you'll be able to uh, lock it in even more. 
uh, get it just a little bit tighter in its tuning. Uh, so let's see how it sounds and just do a little bit of cording on it. So pretty tonal. How about single notes? solid. And that's it. That is how you tune a harmonica. We hope you've enjoyed this presentation as much as we have enjoyed putting it together. And we hope that it might inspire you to open up your own harps, to look inside them, see how they work, and improve their performance.